I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight um, after we had our long, hot summer break. Uh, good to see you. <laughs> no, now we're in our long, hot fall break, I guess. So we're, we here at the Native Plant Project are looking forward to a new year of carrying our mission of collecting and sharing information on native plants of the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, I want to thank everybody who came out to the Centennial event at Benson last Saturday. Um, it was very hot, but we all we were able to uh, have native plants out there and do some teaching. It was their Centennial event. And uh, so whoever came out there to support us, we appreciate it. Um, then our next event will be at Quinta Mazatlan for Planta Nativa. The Native Plant Project will be at the Seed Giveaway booth. We did this last year and it was a big hit. And uh, we're gonna be there. Uh, the date on that is October the 26th. And let's see, it will be from 6.30 to 9.30 p.m. It's on the front lawn there at Quinta. It'll be there again, right, John? Same area? Yeah. You think? Okay, all right. So, and if anybody wants to come and help us out there, volunteer, see me after the meeting. Um, and in November, of course, we're going to be doing the trade show at the Rio Grande uh, Valley Birding Festival in Harlingen. That's our biggest fundraiser of the year. And we also need volunteers for that. You don't have to be uh, on the board to help with that. Anybody can, can we welcome help with that. Uh, it's usually a pretty busy uh, time for us. And it's gonna be from November 9th through the 12th. Uh, most of the days are 12 noon to 6 p.m. at the trade show. Uh, Sunday, the last day, uh, it's from 12 noon to 4 p.m. Uh, so that everybody can break down their booths and get ready and go home. But um, we hope to see you out there. And again, if anybody wants to volunteer for that, you can see me after the program. All right. Um, we want to have a word of congratulations for our board member and past president, Ken King, for winning. the. He's the recipient of the Shirley Lusk Award, which is given by the Native Plant Society of Texas at their annual symposium this year in Nacogdoches. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that our board member, uh, Robert Gaetan, will be the presenter this Thursday evening, uh, September 28th at Quinta Mazatlan for their uh, Thursday night speaker event. And Robert's presentation is entitled, Stewards of the Wild Side, Replace Your Yard with a Habitat. Uh, it sounds very interesting. And I think uh, tickets can be purchased. Can they, did they need to go to the website for that or can they get them there at the door? Okay, wonderful, okay. So that's gonna be really special. All right. It is at, from six to seven, Thursday from six to seven at Quinta Mazatlan in McAllen. All right, now I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening. Janet Schofield is a retired math teacher who quickly became a full-time gardener upon retirement. She is a master gardener as well as a master naturalist in Cameron County and Hidalgo County. She brings specialist training in composting and plant propagation. Her passion is composting, particularly the Hugel culture. Did I say that right? Okay. All right. Good. Okay. And the title of her program this evening is Sustainability, uh, which she feels is the issue of the current century, and that as human beings, we must find a way to relate to our environment more to uh, our environment in a more sustainable way. So tonight, she will describe efforts here in the Rio Grande Valley to develop the Hugo cultures and to create forest gardens. 
with native plants, which I think that's exciting. So, okay, with that, I'll inter I'll leave it up to Janet. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I don't have the usual kind of expertise that you all have, but uh, I'm really interested in this whole culture thing. And I know that's not the right German way to say it, but uh, it's a it's actually a German word. And the Germans are very, very good gardeners. They developed this technique decade, or probably centuries ago. Okay, And so it's a German term and it means mound culture. But to me, uh, the issue of the day and what we should all be talking about everywhere that we talk about anything is sustainability. And how are we going to stay alive on planet Earth, quite frankly, <laughs> we can easily eliminate ourselves as well as all the other things we're eliminating. <laughs> so there are some things we can do though. There are some things that will help us be a more sustainable culture. And I think that the Hugo culture works really well from a composting point of view, okay? Uh, I know lots of techniques of composting. I've composted all over my yard. Uh, this is the first one that we did in Cameron County and it's right behind our regular. And the bottom layer of one of these hugo cultures is made up of logs, and it can be any size logs. It's best to have hardwood, but you can have any types of logs. It's a very good project to start when you're having the trees trimmed in your yard. And that's how we started the first one over in Hidalgo County. And on top of that, you start piling branches, and they can be the thorny things as well as the ones that aren't. So if you're trimming things in your yard, now instead of putting out on the curb, I, my own personal yard in Mercedes, I haven't thrown anything out of my yard for 35 years. It all stays there. <laughs> Some people don't like that, right, Ken? <laughs> you know, but it all stays in there and decomposes. And so this is kind of what it looks like at the beginning stage. And you can see if you have a big trimming project in your yard, is a great time to start one of these hugel cultures. So everything's gonna stay in your yard, okay? You fill it up with leaves, coffee grounds, grass clippings, mulch, anything that'll decompose, okay? And the top layer is compost and mulch. Now the Germans put inverted sod on top of theirs and then they grow plants in it. But I'm telling you, here in the valley, inverted sod does not work. It, yeah, you can guess why. Oh, yeah, it dries up. Anyway. So, so we had to make some adjustments in the original German formula. And an uh, advantage down here is ours actually decompose a bit faster than they do in other areas. Okay? So this is the starting of building it. Uh, we learned quite early on that you should put uh, cardboard and brown paper newspaper, anything at the bottom. Why do you think you do that? Just plywood. Yeah. <laughs> you can reuse the cardboard this way. And you get earthworms if you put cardboard all over your yard. And had a lot of trouble with the early ones with weeds crawling up. <laughs> so this is to keep the weeds down. Okay. And you probably want to water all this in. And everybody's got tons and tons of cardboard around. <laughs> You can easily find cardboard. So we, we start out the bottom with cardboard and newspapers or whatever you have. There's lots of packing materials they use nowadays that, are, but that decomposes, okay? And the base layer is gonna be the biggest logs you can find. Now this is from a smaller hugel. You really, really want big ones. And when I have, I have somebody help me cut my trees in my yard, but I always tell them to make the logs that big for me. And they don't haul it out of my yard so they charge me less because they're not getting rid of it. <laughs> but I make them tell them to saw them in things I can carry. Okay. And so the bottom of this is going to be piles and piles of logs. It's best if you have a big crew of people to help you do all this. <laughs> but if you can, that with the LDS uh, volunteers down in La Feria Nature Park, we made two big ones down there. And they got all the materials from in the park itself. Oh, uh, Latter-day Saints. We used to call them Mormons, but they don't like to be called that anymore. <laughs> they're, they're great volunteers. Yeah, they come and help you with all these kinds of things. That... 
I assume that's a compliment coming from you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> as big as you can get. Those were small ones, but you should put the biggest possible in the bottom because you'll see then it, it lasts longer. But it doesn't matter if you use small ones either. You can be, I have, believe me, I have about eight of these in my yard. And I have some big ones and I have some small ones. And so, and then you put all of those branches and all the stuff that you're trimming out of your yard. And now on the next layer, see, this is a small that I'm building in my backyard. And then I put lots and lots of leaves. Now, I'm one of those people that goes around my car, collects all the bags of leaves that are by the side of the road and that kind of stuff. <laughs> Even some of my neighbors would drop leaves off in my yard for me. Now, that's well-trained neighbors. <laughs> and one of the best things in these piles is coffee grounds. And if you go to Starbucks or any other coffee place that does coffee, you, I'm not talking about a few little coffee grounds from your <laughs> home machine, but uh, Starbucks has a program that's called coffee, coffee or Grounds for the Garden. Grounds for the Garden. They have to keep them for you. They most of them are very willing to, and they keep them in these big bags. This is a seven two two organic fertilizer. So, put lots and lots of it in your hoogles. Okay. Oh yeah, and depending whether you like coffee or not, yeah, it smells good too. I do, all the time. They decompose slower. You know what's nice? I love to put the oak leaves on top of it because I think they look really pretty and they don't decompose as quickly as other leaves, but they're fine. Yeah. So everything, you're going to use everything, anything that decomposes as you put it in there. And the very top layer is where the compost mulch and your plants go. This is my backyard vegetable garden. At one point in time, it was taller than I am when I first put all the logs and branches in it. And after a year and a half, two years, it comes way down. Like if there's more rain and all that kind of stuff, it decomposes even more quickly, okay? And now I, every year I plant my vegetable garden in that. And you realize this is no till, so you're not tilling it up all the time, but I throw back all the vegetables into this pile. And so it decomposes again. And then I put more coffee grounds in and just keep planting in it year after year. It's so much easier than doing a standard type of in the ground vegetable garden. Uh, mine is, this one is, because it depends what you're growing in it. Because you, you don't have to grow vegetables in it. You can grow whatever you want. In them. Okay. This is just a way of, of getting the soil to decompose, or the materials to decompose. You're essentially doing the same thing that happens in a forest floor, kind of, you know, only you're trying to hurry it up a little bit. And the logs that are in the bottom layer will hold water. So, because remember, they're great big logs. In Cameron County, we put it, we had one corner that kept flooding all the time. So you'll see the Mary Lou who go over here is over there in that corner and it soaks up water. So in the upper states, <laughs> is that what you call them? The Midwest and places like that. <laughs> anyway, in the Midwest, they uh, they really don't have to water their hookles very much because it holds so much water. But you know, here in the valley, we're going to have to water, and we don't. It it actually you don't have to water it as much as you would if you didn't have all those logs down there. And so when we do have a big rain, then it's going to be holding the water in there. So that's a big uh, advantage. The pile also supplies nutrients to whatever plants are growing. You can either plant the plants on top, or as I found recently, you can put them down near the bottom and it feeds those plants. Because this is decomposing material, it's a compost thing. And compost is the best thing for the soil. Plus, do you want to dig down into the clay here? <laughs> <laughs> the people who are laughing are the ones that have done it. <laughs> right? You know what, I don't want to. I did it a couple of times I said, no. <laughs> This is a raised bed, you know, but they call it nature's raised bed. And it's a great method for recycling all your lawn and garden materials. I don't put mine on the curb. It all goes in the yard. And scraps too. Uh, no, I put the kitchen scraps in closed composting bins. You know why? 
raccoons, <laughs> possums, rats, <laughs> all those creatures like <laughs> like those things. You put a little pineapple in one, and look, unless you want some animal to get in it and do that, that's fine. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't particularly want the animals. But they don't get into the branches and the coffee grounds. And in fact, a lot of animals are repelled by coffee grounds. And you can put tea ground grounds in it as, as well. It'll do the same thing. Okay. And see, rather than hauling all that over to the dump of the landfills, because they're not doing a hoogle so that it decomposes nice. They're putting it in with plastic and all the other stuff over there. And a big word for nowadays, carbon sequestering. <laughs> These are holding the carbon down and keeping it down in the ground okay? rather than releasing it into the atmosphere. So this is a big, big reason why we want to do this. And it's a no-till method. A lot of people are talking about not tilling. You know why they don't want you to till? What's under the ground? More important than what's above even. Mycelium. So when you till, you break up all those mycelium chains. And uh, my, uh, mycelium is the hyphae that grow under the ground. And you, the, the fruit, you will recognize it's mushrooms. But there's a whole network that grows under the ground. And it supplies both water and nutrition to plants. Plants can't live without the whole network of things going on under the ground. So that's another presentation, right? Yeah, Whoever is expert on mycelium and mushrooms and stuff should really talk about it. Some people think they're going to save us. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, that's why they're promoting no-till. And we're reading this great book. Robert started this book club called the Nature Book Club. We have read the most incredible books there. And it's really changing how I think about a lot of things, especially insects. And uh, another reason that we want to do these hoogles is the insects, you know how they tell you uh, after all your beautiful uh, wildflowers bloom and stuff, don't clear it all away. But why don't you clear it? Because you want the insects to be able to have places to live inside of and to do their cocoons and all the rest of the stuff. Well, Hugo is the perfect place for it. What do you got in there? Lots of places for those all those insects to live. And I'm going to tell you about a book later that you all have to read. And he says that we need to save the insects, especially the native bees and stuff. And native bees need those kind of habitats to live in. So the hoogle is also a habitat for different assorted things. I mean, some people don't like all the assorted things that we create. But I haven't really had any, well, you know. Huh? You're not huh? Yeah. No, I'm not digging. I don't till. <laughs> I'm not tilling it. I'm not breaking it up and doing anything to it. This is the this is the mycelium, and this was these are all pictures from here in the valley from our own gardens. They're not ones I pulled off the internet, and so this is down under one of these. You can see the mushrooms sprouting out from it, and there's the mycelium growing, and the mycelium is very important for plant growth. This is what the soil looks like after a year or so. This is at the bottom of one of the the hoogles. So it's nice. I'm going to see it's not that sticky clay stuff. You can grow anything in it, pretty much. Okay, the building method, I kind of talked about it already. Clear the area of any kind of debris and grass. So sometimes, you know, we have all those invasive grasses. Now, we don't yeah. dig it all out. We uh, weed eat it to the ground. And then put your cardboard and newspapers at the base of that pile. And if the weeds can't get sun, then they can't grow. And you can put as much as you want, as many layers as you want underneath there. Then you make a base out of uh, any kind of wood, but the hardwoods that we have, the mesquite and the Texas ebony and stuff like that make excellent, excellent things to put at the bottom. My, that vegetable garden of mine that you saw in that picture is already down to the big logs. And so if you have big that are hardwood, it'll last longer. But you can start it all over again, too. You can always start a new one. And then you pile branches and other decomposable materials into it. Okay. And I get enough stuff from my yard. I don't have to get stuff from anywhere else. 
Okay, so here's another one that we built someplace. So you see, we got the cardboard down there. And when you're going to clear up something and you've got all these, especially if you have a lot of laborers around that, <laughs> that to carry all this stuff for you, but you can do it yourself too. I mean, Janice Silvery and I made one of the hoovels. I'll show you which one it is by ourselves, the two of us, because they had a big pile of stuff piled up in the middle of the garden and it was unsightly. <laughs> so we made it into a hoovel. And then you see there's leaves. So it's good to have bags and bags of leaves everywhere that add to it. You can always add more leaves. You can always add more coffee grounds at any point. You fill it up with coffee grounds, tea grounds, grass things are great in compost. I can make co compost in about two to three weeks with just leaves, coffee grounds, and grass clippings because it decomposes so quickly. The grass clippings are smaller, so the surface area. A, a hugel takes a while because it's a cold method. It's not hot. And we water them thoroughly when we first set them up. Okay. And then you shouldn't have to water as much later, but here in the valley, watering is always an issue. And then cover the top with the compost or potting soil or whatever, whatever you have, especially if you want to grow plants on the top. Yeah. So there's one we built and see, that was when the vegetable garden was there. See, we threw all the vegetables right on top of it. It's, and see, you can see some of the logs down at the base. I mean, you can keep it so it looks kind of nice. <laughs> it depends how fussy people around you are. <laughs> I live by myself. So I can do what I want. <laughs> but <laughs> not every I understand not everybody has that luxury. <laughs> and that, that's another one. This is in the Cameron County garden that we built, this one. And there's another one. So you can build them all sizes. And it depends. If you've got a bunch of stuff that you know you're going to have to get rid of, don't take it out to the curb. Build yourself up a hoople. Now, these are some examples. Uh, we have many of these in the Cameron County uh, educational garden. This is the one just off the freeway on Williams Road. San Benito, yeah, in San Benito. This is our original hugel. That's a compost bin that's up there. And the first one we made, we did it as, we have composting classes. So we did it as part of a class. That was way above what that bin is. It's taller than I am. And now it's way down there. We've grown vegetables in it. We've grown trees in it. We've grown all kinds of stuff in it at this point. And this is what it looks like right now. And it depends who puts what in there, you know. I don't usually put the plants in, somebody else does. And now, now we started naming, this is Charlene. And Charlene made that this big, long hoogle over there. And she's putting trees in hers. And she's been taking care of this one. That's one end of it. And that's the other end. Usually you make them pretty long. Don't make them too wide. And you have to make them like as tall as me, because I'm 5'4". And you can make them taller if you want. And that's the, Mary Lou's hole is very famous. This is the one that's down in the corner where all the water hit. And everybody kept bringing all kinds of stuff. So she made a U-shaped one. So you can see it, you know, going around. It's like a U-shape. And then she decided she's going to plant succulents and cacti and all kinds of stuff here. She planted a bunch of other stuff over here. And when it's Nepali season, people come in all the time and ask for Nepali stuff here. And this back section, she just keeps adding more stuff to it. It builds it up. Uh, this is one. Jim Ratcliffe is one of our gardeners. He swore he would never make a hoogle. He's, he's trying to grow grapes there right now. And he started digging a hole and putting logs in. <laughs> I said, hey, Jim, you're making a hoogle. So there he is. <laughs> Right? <laughs> I mean, because everybody complains the soil is no good. There's nothing in it. The nutrition, there's no nutrition in it and stuff. So you got to do something to amend that soil. And what a better way than throw it. Before they would take all this stuff and throw it in the bin outside, send it to the landfill, you know. And this is our native plant garden that we have in the Cameron County. That's me. And they told me, don't make any more hoogles. We got enough. But some, but somebody left uh, three or four logs right here. So we had to build one right here. So that, right? Yeah, if you have a bunch of logs and a bunch of sticks and whatever, you just got to make one. And this is actually what it looks like or did look like 
Let's see. That's what it did look like is this, only it was a little bit taller. And now, I don't know if you can tell what that is. These are my pictures, so they're not always very clear. This is all frog fruit growing up here. Frog yeah, frog fruit. So see, it grows really well because it's nice composted soil. And we've got a couple of trees in there and some red salvia and some other things growing on it. So that's the hugel, but now it's all covered with plant material. And I did a workshop and then these two ladies from, well, the, the winter Texan is the one on the left. That's the mother. She went back to Minnesota and told her daughter about this. And they sent me pictures of the hugels that they made up in Minnesota. <laughs> So, I mean, it's just very appealing because you're using up stuff that's already in your yard. It's not costing you any money. It's costing you a little bit of effort, though, but not a lot of money. And that's a vegetable hugel. That's the one you saw before that's in my yard. And I've grown lots of vegetables in there. Uh, I try to grow broccoli, but the, my, I have a family of chachalacas that live in my yard. And they, they, for some reason, they just love broccoli. And they eat it up all the time. I love it too, but I can never get any to grow. And then over here is a, a vegetable garden that was in Cameron County, right up next near the, uh, near the fence. And this one is the one that Janice and I did, the two of us. There was a bunch of debris left in the garden. We made a huge, long, thin hugel. It was taller than I am. And eventually got down to this point and we planted herbs in this one. So we call it the herb hugel. And now it looks kind of like this. I didn't get a really good picture of it, but lots of things growing. This is one of the hugels in my yard. So the hugel is like right here. And when these plants grow up, there's a sage and some other things over here. This is one that's in my backyard. I have them all over the place because when I clean out something, I'm not, I don't want to haul it a long way. I just throw it on top of that hugel that's right there. And this is one that I have in my side yard. And you see the Turk's cap loved it. Took off and now it's all full of Turk's cap. <laughs> and this is one that's in my front yard. And, uh, oops. So that one has no height left at all. It's completely to the ground now. And you see there's chard and stuff. Growing. I grow vegetables all over my whole yard. Okay. I, during the uh, COVID, the first four months of it, I did not go to a grocery store, period. I ate vegetables from my yard. Now, I did order some rice and noodles and stuff like that from Amazon. But I did not go to the inside a grocery store because there's so much stuff growing in my yard. Remember, it was February, March when we first went down? Yeah. And so there was lots of, it was the right time of year for it. And, uh, oh, we started the original one in Hidalgo County, and it happened, Mirtala Rodriguez, I don't know, she's a master gardener and a master naturalist. We were in the park on a day when the county came and trimmed all the trees, okay? And I'd been reading about this. I said, oh, Mirtala, are you going to help me? <laughs> she always is up for it. And you know, those guys would not help us pull those logs over there, we, but they did let us have them. So we, <laughs> so we made a big hool over in in uh, Hidalgo County. So there's a couple of them over there. In fact, where the where this uh, aloe vera is growing right now, those used to be who are bigger, taller than I am. And all of that along the fence is one big hoogle. They still throw way too much stuff away over there. They're throwing a lot of it because <laughs> I'm not always there. If I'm there, I grab it. But <laughs> And you might not want to put a lot of weeds in it, especially with those that are seeded out and stuff, because that can be a problem. And in, I also belong to the community garden Mercedes. So we're trying to, we're trying to get sweet potatoes to grow into one of the hoogles. And I think, I think it's a good thing because I think they can grow down into the, because it keeps air down there. Okay. And that's the, I think that's the end of my hoogle stuff. Now, I'm going to do another presentation about forest gardens, but yeah, sure. yeah, Googles, yeah, Googles. yeah. How do you keep them? Add more stuff. Add, kind of like, stuff? Oh, coffee see, grounds. coffee grounds, leaves, cuttings, clippings from the yard. Uh, in your vegetable garden, throw the vegetable scraps. Now, on the, the herb hoogle, 
that's over in camera. What we did is we took the one half of, or not a half, about a third of it on the end and made that into another hubu. So you can redo them and rebuild them. And we've tried to make real small ones. It doesn't work so well on a small level. But you can kind of use this idea if you're potting in a big pot. Don't put styrofoam in the bottom or fill it up with other stuff. Put a bunch of branches and leaves and that kind of stuff into the bottom of the pot just to fill it up. And that kind of works like a hookah because over time it'll decompose. Yeah, you can make different sizes. But I'm telling you, the big ones decompose faster and work better. Because for decomposition, you kind of need that pressure from the top, I guess. I don't, I don't know what it is. Yeah, you can put it by trees. You can put them anywhere. Yeah, you can put them anywhere that your husband or wife will let you. <laughs> well, it depends how much of the compost and stuff that you put on the top. Usually, you let it decompose well first, and then you can start planting stuff. Like a year? But, yeah, a year is more than enough time. Yeah, but I'm finding, too, that sometimes it's good just to have a hugel that feeds something else. And I'm going to show you an example in the next PowerPoint we do, where as it's decomposing, it's feeding plants that are off to the left or right, too. So you can use it for that purpose also. And sometimes we plant at the bottom of the hugel, around the outside edge, and let it crawl up on there. We grew watermelons over in Mercedes that way this summer. Wow. <laughs> it, we're still experimenting. I mean, I mean, this is a big experiment, is what it is, of how to figure out how to get this stuff to work in the valley. But to me, it's kind of a win-win because you're not throwing all that stuff into the landfill. I, the, I like the openings for the cinder blocks because you can grow little plants in there. Yeah. Like you can, but a hugel tends to ho hold water anyway. But I, I like decomposing. You don't have to yeah. put them back in. And there used to be some chemical they made the cinder blocks with that wasn't good for you. But I read that the, more, the newer ones, they don't put that in anymore. Yeah, they used to put a lot of stuff into things that were <laughs> caused <Yeah>. cancer. <laughs> and now they don't tend to put so much of that into those things. What's anymore. the watering like? How often do you water? How do you know when to water? Depends on the weather. Totally. I mean, because after a good rain, it's going to soak up quite a bit. But we do have to water like when it's like it is now. I'll put a hose on top of mine. Just let it run. Depends on what's growing under it, too, if you're trying to keep anything growing. If you're just allow, wanting it to decay, you don't really need to water it. It won't decay as fast, but you don't need to water it if you don't want to. Yeah, so so eventually, does that just become like a little regular garden? Yeah, don't, yeah. Don't yeah. yeah. In fact, it's a long time before all those big logs decompose. Some of them at the bottom of my vegetable garden are starting to decompose now after three years. And then you get all the mycelium and the mushrooms coming out of everywhere. And, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Eventually it just becomes like a forest floor more than anything else. You know, have you ever walked through a forest and you see how all that decomposed stuff? <laughs> In <laughs> That's what we're going to talk about next is forest gardens. Uh, any more questions about the hoogles? I'm glad you're also enthusiastic about them. Not everybody is. <laughs> you got to experiment with it yourself. And I'm not particularly stuff like making it look nice, but I think there's ways you could make it look nice if you framed it and did some things to it. You know, I think they look great. The logs around. Yeah, yeah, the logs around them. That's a great way to put it. Do it, and it adds to it. Yeah. One layer of logs, layers, and we put one layer, but you could put two if you wanted. If you wanted to last longer, you could put as many as you got. These things are called nature's raised beds. That's the Jordan tribe for coffee ground. Yep. That's that's a great door prize. I'm telling you. I do organic gardening. It's a 722 fertilizer. And it's free if you go to Starbucks and tell them that you want the grounds for the garden. The coffee grounds. They have a program and they have to give them to you. And the tea leaves too, they'll keep the tea leaves if you ask them. Any more questions about those? I'm glad you're asking lots of stuff about hoogles. I love them. You know? <laughs> okay. This, this next one, and Ken's going to pronounce all the Latin names. I, 
I am old enough that I had to take two years of Latin in high school. Oh, wow. And I cannot pronounce these things for the life of me. And I should be able to if anybody can. But I'm a, a terrible language learner, you know. And I also can't pronounce the names. So Ken's going to do all the Latin names. She can explain the Fibonacci. Oh, yeah. The Fibonacci sequence is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's related to plants. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've been I've been doing my garden like I said I haven't been taking anything out of it for 35 years and just planting I'm not real organized about what I planted and whatever and then I started thinking hmm what am I doing here and I found this online someplace something called a forest garden and that's what my garden is it's a forest garden okay so I'm going to explain to you what a forest garden is and try to convince you that maybe you could you don't have to do this on a big scale you can do it on a small scale also and uh, the thing is, do we want our yards to look like this? Or do we want them to look like this? See, we can't, we cannot afford to have yards that look like this anymore. It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of water. And people put fertilizer all over it. And all those chemicals are not good for the landscape. Okay? We all need to be doing our version, and I'm not saying you have to do my version, <laughs> of this kind of thing. And I'm telling you, you wouldn't believe the birds that come in your yard and stuff. Somebody came into my yard once and said, this, it sounds like a wildlife refuge in here. I live in, in Mercedes, right on the edge kind of where that creek is. But, <laughs> you know, there's lots and lots of birds. This is my where my house is, what it looks like from Google Maps. So you can see... Back here is where Aunt Quintus uh, Creek is. Let me make that thing. Oops. Aunt Quintus Creek is that along the backside. And then now they're putting housing behind me. There never used to be any housing back there, but there is now. And then you can see where the other houses are, but you see what my yard looks like? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? You can tell from Google Maps. And that's what it looks like from the front. Now, I live in Mercedes. Nobody complains about it. As long as you don't have a bunch of rusty old cars in your front yard, they're quite happy with you. Nobody complains about my yard. And a forest garden is just one that mimics a natural forest or a woodland ecosystem. Okay? So it looks like a during COVID, every day I went out and walked around the backyard. Called it the infinity path. Just the path around there. Keep going around, <laughs> and uh, so I started getting mulch from the garden and community garden, and making little paths. And forest gardens are designed to promote healthy and diverse natural elements while also meeting human needs. Now these are not totally forests because they're not completely natural. You're also growing food for yourself, okay? And I have other plants. I like roses and <laughs> some other things, so I don't have all native plants in my yard. That thanks to Ken's influence, <laughs> I have quite a lot. And thanks to these plants here. A lot of the plants in my yard came from here. Okay, it, what, what it is, it's kind of an organized system for those of you who like organization. You have a tall tree layer, a low tree layer, a shrub layer, an herb layer, a ground cover layer, a vine layer, and then a root layer under the ground. So there's the seven layers to a forest garden. And you can you don't have to do them all at once or you don't have to do them in order or anything like that. But you could kind of think about your own garden and think about which of these things that you already have. You know, and then when you add something new, see so you have the big tall overstory trees and then the other smaller things, a shrub layer and the herb layer, the root layer, the ground cover layer and the vine layer. Okay, so the tall tree layer. Now here's where our native plants come in. Okay, where Ken has to start reading the names. And these are just, some, these are the ones that I have in my yard. Some of them, I don't have everything labeled <laughs> yet. <laughs> so it should suit the climate and microclimate conditions where you live. Okay, so you have to adjust it for the area of the valley where you live. And even in your own yard, you have different microclimates where different kinds of things can grow. So you have to consider that when you're, especially the tall trees, you got to be careful what you put in and where you put them. 
and you have to think about your soil type and its characteristics. Now, I've been composting for a long time, so I have a major amount of compost all over my yard. And if you don't, you can go get leaves. Go pick them up. People put them out in the curb for you. All you have to do is pick them up. Uh, so you got to think about what you got. The tall trees are 30 feet or more, ones that are going to grow to 30 feet or more. Okay. So you'll probably all have your favorites. My favorite, well, actually a couple of the, the Texas ebony and the Wyacon. I love those two trees. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, here's what Ken's can say. Otherwise, no one has Wisachi. <laughs> Because it has all those pretty beautiful yellow flowers and it smells so good in the spring. I mean, everybody needs a wasachi in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's another picture of them with the beans. And, the, you know, the beans are really good. I like to eat them. The Texas ebony. Yeah, I, this tree actually is an old picture of my tree. It's big, big now. And the other day, I not, I'm not a very good scientist because I'm not, very complete. I counted at least 10 bird nests in there, but I bet there were more. And now I'm starting to get more smaller birds. This tree is great if you want small birds in your yard because they're protected inside there. Yeah. And I I love the ratama. And ratama grows so quickly. And I just like it for, I guess, psychological reasons. I like to just look up at it. And it has those airy kind of leaves and it looks up into the sky and and they grow really fast. <laughs> I don't. I don't have any ATB bags. These are in my yard, Ken. See any ATB bags hanging from those? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, but in some places it does, and they grow very quickly. But they're beautiful, beautiful trees. And I had in my property originally a lot of real, uh, several real Grande ash, probably four. Huh? And they're still growing. I thought they. This one, do you see what happened to this tree? There, there was some sort of tornado-like thing in Mercedes. Somebody said a, a mesquite got up, lifted up out of the ground and dumped over in their front yard. So I think it was a small tornado or something, but it ripped several of the huge branches at the top, two of them of this one. This was very tall. And so I had to have somebody come and cut it all off. And then I just let all that grow back. I mean, I didn't do like whatever you are supposed to do. Cut all the stuff off the bottom. and You know, there's certain things that gardening people tell you that you should do. I didn't do that. <laughs> I just let it grow however it wanted to. And and I like the way it looks. But that, that thing was ripped apart in that, whatever that big wind was. And it came back. And I love honey mesquite. Now, I only have one in my yard. These are actually from, uh, do any of you know the Laferia Nature Park? How about in that lake over there? They have, they planted some really nice mesquites there. I love mesquite. This is so magical, I think, is a, is a way to describe a mesquite. And this is a Montezuma bald cypress in my backyard. In Mercedes, we now had a project, last, I don't keep Mercedes beautiful. Okay. And we had a project last year where we built we have several retention ponds in Mercedes. Retention ponds are great things. We have the biggest one in the valley. It's called the floodway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? It's a huge retention pond. And by, when they built high school uh, stadium, they put three small retention ponds there. And last year, they had some big project because one of those poor neighborhoods over on the side of town, on the west side of town, had flooded. So they built three more retention ponds over there. Well, we planted last year uh, nine of the Montezuma bald cypress at the high school retention ponds. And we applied for a grant and didn't get it <laughs> so we could plant more at the other retention ponds. And, you know, have you been to the one down in Brownsville where they had a Montezuma? You have. <laughs> What's it called? The Montezuma, Montezuma bald cypress Park. 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 Yeah. Yeah, and they, they're doing some big things over there with this Montezuma bald cypress. But I love those trees. But they need to be down in retention box because they need water all. Yeah. Huh? yeah. 
Now, uh, one of my other favorites, and these are from my yard, is the anaqua. You know, after that horrible freeze we had, you know, the first thing that the birds could eat was off the anaqua trees. Because they, they, I've noticed that the anaquas seem to bloom at different times. They don't all bloom at once. They don't all, you know, and and their berries are great. They taste really good. And so there's the anaqua when it's in bloom. Oh, I forgot to have Pen, Ken say the Latin name. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, most of you probably can pronounce these things. I can't pronounce them. <laughs> and there's another, I mean, I just love the way they look. So you can never have too many anaqua trees. For, in terms of birds and uh, supplying, uh, huh? butterflies. oh, butterflies and bees. Mm -hmm. And that's, <laughs> that's the Chachalaca family. It's been living in my yard for about five years or so. And this year, I think they had three or four. These are when they were still small. They're bigger now. They can be annoying, I can tell you. And they love Turk's cat. They love broccoli. They, you know, they like an aqua. <laughs> they live in the aqua trees. Okay. Now, the next layer down, remember, is the low tree layer. So we're still talking about trees, but they don't quite as high. These are only 10 to 30 foot. And they produce fruits, seeds for birds. And again, you got to consider your climate and the microclimate and where you live and so on. But some of these will grow almost everywhere in the valley. They, those Mexican olive trees, I just love them. And we took a, a movie clip the other day of a Mexican olive in Mercedes. There were probably a hundred hummingbirds on it. Yeah. See, I think you should have everyone get rid of their hummingbird feeders. You know, just ask them. Do you take yours down and clean it out every two days? <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you have a Mexican olive tree, you don't need to clean it out. And Turks cap, they love Turks cap also. So Mexican olive trees, potato trees, Colima, Texas mountain laurel. We have so many choices here. And I don't know if Vitex, is it a Valley native? No. Is it a Texas native? No. Oh, it's on neither one? It's from oh, really? Well, I have a Vitex, and I like it. <laughs> I, I like fragrant things, Ken. Not stinky. <laughs> fragrant. <laughs> I love durian. It smells good, though. <laughs> okay. This is, yeah, this is the Mexican olive. And, I, you know, they, they're using them all over for landscaping now. And another of my favorites is the potato tree. And it's so good for birds and so good for butterflies and all kinds of stuff. So this this is in my backyard. And and this one is the I'm prickly ash. Some people don't like Colima because of all the spikes on it. I like it because of the smell, the fragrance. Yeah. Smell because it's in the citrus family. And it's also, I think, a host plant for some kinds of butterflies. Yeah, swallowtails. Oh, swallowtails. Oh, okay. No wonder I have swallowtails in my yeah. <laughs> And well, this is the one that Ken says I shouldn't have. But <laughs> those Vitex smell really good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, grew, I grew up with Vitex. <laughs> it does. Anyway, I grew up with lilacs in, in Wisconsin. So I missed it. And this is a Palo Verde. This is not actually in my yard. I bought a small one here last meeting that you had. And uh, so I have a small one, but this is the one that's down by the battlegrounds down in Bronzeville. Yeah, they have two, one on each side. Is yeah. Texana? Yeah. Oh, so it's Texana. Okay, thanks. Re remember that so I can write it down. Tell you, all, if you see mistakes or there's things, I, I would really like to fix them up. So let me know. I know Drew critiqued it already once, but, and I love this tree, the Texas mountain laurel. And this one's growing in my backyard. It doesn't have quite enough sun. You know, you need to have it in a real sunny spot to get the maximum out of it uh, when it blooms. It only, I think it only blooms once a year, doesn't it? Yeah, for a very short period. Yeah, and, but it doesn't have any stickers. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's very unusual for plants down here. Now, this is one, this is not a native, but remember, a forest garden is also for you to eat from. And so I, I like this uh, sugar apple soursop. Yeah. 
And uh, so I have food plants. So when you're doing a forest garden, you can have natives and food plants. But this is, and this is a fig tree. We, we can grow all kinds of figs down here. I love figs. And okay, now, now we're down a layer. So we're down to the shrub layer. And this is where you can put all your butterfly plants and all those kind of woody plants and stuff. So we're now lower down. All your butterfly post plants and stuff are in this shrub layer. And this is the three to 12 feet, depending on how you trim it. Hachinel, I love Hachinel. And uh, it, and this is probably one of my favorite natives. And I got the first one, we dug it up. I dug it up with Ken King. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't everybody? <laughs> I love this foot. The shrubby blue sage is really good for making smudge sticks. You know, you know, the smudging that the American Indians do, they do it with white sage. But you can do it with blue sage because it has an a incredible smell. And and it is a native. I know that, right? Yeah. Say the say the Latin name. Balita flora. flora. Yeah. Okay. And of course, I, I mean, I love Turk's cap. It might be one of my favorite of these shrubby plants because so many things eat it. I like to eat it. It's high in vitamin C, you know. It tastes really good when those berries get nice and red. And I, I've seen the chachalacas eating it. The hummingbirds are all over it. And it spreads all over your yard. You know, the birds plant it for you. And this is beautiful. I was so happy to see you had some of this here tonight because I just killed mine. <laughs> And, you know, Mike keeps says it, it does die back every two or three years or something. He, and so, he says some of them die completely after about three. Yeah, yeah. But they're so beautiful, you know. And, I, of course, one of my favorites also is Sinisa. I love that um, way it looks and stuff. And it so much of the year. It's easy to propagate it. It's easy to, it's, this is a good one to convince people to landscape with. See a lot of people landscaping with this one. And uh, this is the Greg's mist flower. There's se several kinds of mist flowers. So in your shrub layer, you can have all kinds. And the butterflies just flock to it. They just, all butterflies, I think, flock to this mist flower. They love it. And there's a, are those my monarchs? No, those are queens, aren't they? The tropical milkweed. That's the only one so far that I can keep growing. <laughs> I'm trying the other ones, but I can't keep those growing. And fiddlewood, of course, is a great butterfly plant. And it recedes itself and grows all over the place if you want it to. Huh? How do you say that one? There's one for you. Yeah, I said the red, correct that one. Okay, say it again. The whole Sitarexum? Sitarexum. <laughs> and the skeleton leaf base daisy is just one that you need in every landscape it's so nice you cut those buds off and then they come back right back out again you know and this is not a native but i love hibiscus i used to live in malaysia it was the national flower and so i have lots of hibiscus in my yard but the black dragon is one of my favorites. And I also like antique roses. So I have a lot of antique roses also. This is the the sweetheart rose, the Cecil Bruna. Who started you on antique roses? Uh, Richard Lehman. <laughs> <laughs> and the Antique Rose Emporium up in Independence. My son went to A&M and I went to the Rose Emporium. <laughs> but, and this one is in my backyard. It's called Archduke Charles. And see, you get hybrid roses, they last, for me anyway, two, three, four years at best. That one's been back there for about 15 years, 20 years. And why is it growing so well? Guess what's right behind it? Oh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's feeding it. <laughs> and this one, mine, it borders right on my neighbor's house. She said it makes her happy every day when she walks out. It's huge, this Mertably, but it has a hugel in back of it and on this side. And I couldn't figure out why it was so big. And so it's because those hoogles are feeding it all the time. So it's growing really, really big. Now, it doesn't look so good after this 
big heat dome we had. <laughs> Roses do not like the heat, <laughs> but I have to clip it back quite a bit. It has, you notice it has three different colors. Oh, yeah. See, it, Ken has to tell me where in his book is this one. <laughs> It used to be called the spiny, well, still it's common, it's spiny, yeah. It's a yeah. uh, semi-trickle, semi-light. <laughs> you know exactly how to spell that, Yeah, yeah. I, I told him he's got to show where it is in the book. <laughs> and this one? Yeah. It's a solid day, though. It's <laughs> Okay. Now we're down to the next layer. I forgot what this layer is called. Oh, the herbal, the herb, herbaceous, herbaceous, not herbs, but herbaceous air, uh, level. And these are perennial plants. They're edibles, both for humans and animals. And, you know, you should plant things in your yard that your family likes to eat because then they'll buy you and help you take care of it. And, want to go out and pick it and all this kind of stuff. And I like to eat the stuff from my yard. I per way prefer it over buying vegetables that came from South America or Mexico or someplace. <laughs> and these are the two to 12 feet. Notice that all those layers are different numbers of feet from above the ground. This is, this is my herb garden in back. I have it in cinder blocks. And there's a, there's a hugo in this part of it and so that hugel feeds it i have to replant herbs often because the summer just does horrible things to herbs but and this is a these are just things that are growing in my yard that's a big tomato plant uh chard chard is a good thing to put because chard always looks nice and it easily replaces any spinach thing it grows much better than spinach and taste i think it tastes and yeah, collards. Collards go great down here and they taste really good in a lot of things. But notice they look nice. They're nice, they're pretty looking plants. I think you can convince people to plant that kind of stuff in their yard. And this one's basil. And there's some more tomatoes. And uh, we can grow lots and lots of kale. <laughs> and they, I think they look nice, you know? There's some broccoli and all this stuff. There's egg. We can grow tons and tons of eggplant. And then, then there's a ground. Remember, there's a ground cover layer. I have only two kinds of crown cover. I should expand and get some more. But lots and lots of frog fruit. Frog fruit is just a great thing here. It it's host to some little butterfly, and all those little skipper butterflies just love to land all over that frog fruit. And it lasts through the heat, but you know the thing that first in the Cameron County Garden after that week long freeze, the frog fruit. <laughs> wow. it's and it sometimes we got to pull it out because it's up in the other plants and all over the thing. It it just grows really well and it's a really good butterfly plant. It's better than that stupid invasive grass, you know. Yeah, yeah. and it'll fight the grass. It'll keep it back. And this is the snake herb. It doesn't have flowers. It has little purple flowers. So it looks really nice when it blooms. And then we have the vine layer. This is my least favorite layer. Ken tried to convince me that I should like vines. I hate vines. <laughs> I only have one picture. This is the... Because <laughs> I pull out most vines in my yard because they strangle all the other stuff. But I'm going to try to grow more vines. <laughs> This is the passion, yeah, the corky stem passion flower. Because I like those butterflies, the go go over the layer. Yeah. yeah, that grows on this. The birds like to eat the fruits also. Oh, yeah. Yeah, see, a lot of these are really multi purpose in the sense of it. And then we have the layers that are below the soil. So you can, you got all kinds of things and food crops that grow under the soil. We've even grown potatoes down here. If you grow into compost, you can grow potatoes and they taste good. This is my favorite, favorite vegetable, beets. Oh, beets. beets, yeah, you can eat the greens, but the beets, and the beets are good for your blood pressure and all that kind of stuff. And you, so you can put, and look, they look pretty nice too. You just oh, yeah. can grow them all over the place. 
Okay, now why do you want to have a forest garden? <laughs> First of all, helps control pests and diseases. I use neem sometimes on some things. I have those cotton fields near me. And when they spray, guess where their white flies go? Yeah. Because the cotton is the host plant for the white flies. So all the white flies fly to your yard. <laughs> but I, I've been controlling mine with neem. And I really don't have much trouble with them anymore. Yeah, so over a long term of having kind of a more natural system, it reduces the need for, and I, I've been an organic gardener for a long, long time since I was in college. That's a long time ago. <laughs> so I don't ever put any of that uh, chemical stuff in my yard. I always try to look for an organic solution to, some, to everything. And it works, you have to repeat organic stuff over and over sometimes, but over the long run, things start being in control. And, okay, so all these things that you got in your yard are going to help reduce the need and, and pest control. Like If you have trouble with mice and rats and stuff, if you plant some peppermint, they don't like peppermint. So you can put peppermint in strategic places and try to keep them out. Or you can import an indigo snake. <laughs> we have one that lives in our neighborhood. I, I saw the most amazing thing once, right just outside my carport, and I heard something moving around in the bushes over there and stuff. I thought it was a thrush. I had lots and lots of thrushes in my yard. But you know how they scoot around underneath and make lots of noise? And that's what I thought it was. And I looked over there. There was an indigo with a, a mouse or a rat in its mouth. <laughs> that was cool. And I thought it was cool. And I knew that snake wouldn't hurt me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. Another allows us to breathe easier if you have a forest garden because plants produce oxygen. Uh, they exhale oxygen, but they also help clear the air of air pollution. And soil, did you know soil is an antidepressant? It's actually, there's a chemical. And can you say that, Ken? Mycobacterium. Yeah, that stuff. is in the soil, and it helps release serotonin in your body. So there is a reason that when you go out and mess around in the garden and put a, you know, dig around in the soil, there, there's an actual physical reason that you feel better. And it aids in environmental control because when there's flooding, guess who's sucking up all that water? The trees. They can suck up a lot of water. And it stabilizes and protects the soil. Like underneath there, you need to think about what's going on underneath the soil too. Because if you have several trees and bushes and all that stuff, it's all interlaced underneath and connected with all the mycelium and stuff. So it makes your garden more resilient to environmental changes. See, what's going to happen to this that first slide I showed you? People that have only a big blotch of grass. Like, <laughs> it won't taste. It's, it won't taste. You won't be able to eat it. <laughs> and it also helps reduce uh, sound pollution coming from the roads. Uh, and it's relaxing to be out there and spend some time out in your little forest garden. Provides you with abundant edible crops. If you think about it, put some fruit trees and put some plants. I like chart. I like bok choy. I love bok choy. And it grows down here really easily. And there's always things that you can find. And if you start eating seasonally, those things, they taste really good when they're in season. And it also, you know, if you do crafts and stuff, you can go pick the leaves off and do all that stuff. And you can get herbal medicines from your herbal garden. I don't, I don't know anything about plant, plant fibers and dyes, but some of those, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they'll die. Uh, and it makes your gardening easier. Now, I didn't believe this at first, but I used to have a front yard. I don't have a front yard, any, uh, any grass in the front yard. I don't have any grass in my side yards. I have a little bit in the back, just for old time's sake. Because <laughs> you got to remind yourself every once in a while, you got to mow it and you got to edge it and you got to do all this other stuff to it. It's a lot of maintenance, maintaining a lawn. And I came back from, I left for three weeks, four weeks to visit at my son's house up in the woodlands. I came back, my front yard looked exactly like it looked when I left. <laughs> I didn't have to do anything if I didn't want to. 
I mean, I always am messing around doing stuff, but I, it stayed the same. <laughs> you know, so you got to think about that. Once you have a coach, you got to spend some work doing your hoogles and planting your stuff and whatever, but that's fun. Yeah. Do it a little bit at a time. You don't have to do the whole thing all at once. So uh, the thing you want to do, this is kind of like when you make a hoogle. If you're going to set up a forest garden, you got to get rid of those invasive grasses that we have because they're just horrible. And you can do it with cardboard and mulch. And worms love cardboard. You will have worms all over your yard if you put lots of cardboard there. And you'll be recycling all the cardboard, okay? And you, you're you gonna have to, if you have degraded soil, we all have degraded soil. The whole Midwest is degraded. <laughs> Every place that they farmed agriculture is degraded. <laughs> It, we really need to start putting some nutritious stuff back into the soil. And we can do it on our own level in our own gardens. And if you use a lot of compost and mulch, in Mercedes, we have a community garden. We have a giant pile of mulch in back. Anybody can help themselves to it. Yep. Mm -hmm. But a lot of landscaping places will dump mulch for you places because they have to pay to put it in a landfill. So they're willing to dump it for you. And then you should choose plants and a planting scheme that fit wherever it is that you live. Even if you live in an apartment and you have just a little few containers someplace or something, you know, there's something probably that everybody can do no matter how big or small their places are. And, and don't take on more than what you can. I, I do that all the time. <laughs> take on more than what I can keep up with. But you layer your plants in space and time. You notice how all those layers make you space it out a little bit. And, uh, okay. And the, oh, those, yeah, yeah, I cut off the top, but it, this doesn't say anything that I haven't already said. So you got your tall canopy layers, but you got all those vines that should be coming up through it. I don't have very many vines. I'm going to put more, Ken. You tell me what to put in there. He's a vine person. <laughs> yeah, he tried to, you're going to advise me on vines. Because <laughs> I do need more vines in my yard. And you should, yeah. Make sure your element in your forest garden is beneficial, either to you, something that you can use, something that you can eat, or to the system. Like you're trying to support certain animals, or you're trying to support the bees, or you're trying to support the monarchs, or whatever it is. And, you know, in Japan, have you heard of forest bathing? The, yeah, one of the books that we read in our book club thing is called Forest Bathing. The Japanese have taken it to the ultimate levels, <laughs> you know. Because they take actual instruments out and measure people's blood pressure and stress levels and all this kind of stuff. They have all kinds of proof that this stuff really works. And the Japanese name for it is shin, Shinrin Yoku, taking in the forest through senses. So they use it as a way, a, a kind of therapy for people that are all stressed out. And you know, they, they live in those cities with those little tiny things. I don't know how they do it. And anyway, when you're out in the forest, you open up your senses for you to see it and smell it. They want you to smell the smell from the trees and all that. And uh, open up all your senses. And then it, it's supposed to bridge a gap between you and the natural world. And when you're in harmony with the natural world, then you can begin to heal is what they say. And it also... It's kind of a, it gives you a profound sense of the beauty and mystery of the universe when you're out in nature like that. I mean, there's more and more proof all the time that people need this. And if you can have your little piece of your forest, and we have a different kind of forest than the Japanese have, but we have our own special trees and all that kind of stuff. We, we're very blessed because we have a lot of kind of plants and stuff that we can use for this uh, forest bathing. That's a very good book anyway, if you like to read it. And this is my new favorite book. Well, oh, this guy is just incredible. Nature's Best Hope. <laughs> Don't read that unless you plan on doing some things because he gives you lists of things that you can do <laughs> yeah. and ways that you can, all those questions that people ask you about why you should plant natives and stuff and why not have all the tropicals and stuff like that. He's got answers for all of that stuff. This book is incredible. I, I hadn't read this book yet when I put together this forest garden thing, but <laughs> this guy, apparently he was at Quinta Matsalan 
yeah. years ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But he, he says, I mean, he has some dire predictions that will happen if we all don't start doing all this stuff and taking care of it. I mean, you all are already convinced because you're Native Plant Project, but your job is to convince other people. And what can, you know, even if they can start on a small level, they can do a three by three butterfly garden in their front yard or something like that, you know, it already will help our environment <laughs> and the insects and therefore us. So I, I highly recommend that you read this book if you haven't. I'm, not, I'm reading it for the second time. This It's information density, <laughs> like you wouldn't believe. And this is my backyard part of it. Yeah, I have a pond. My son and I dug it. When he my son was in high school, he and I dug this pond. <laughs> so then those are my references. Okay. Uh that that's the forest bathing book, the one by Dr. Quinley. Okay. Any questions? Thank you for being such a great audience. <laughs>